Thanks so much for watching or listening to my show. If you don't already know, if you listen to the podcast and want to see some visuals, you can check us out on YouTube, and if you watch on YouTube and are going to be out and about, you can listen to the stories in podcast form. Crazy world we live in, I know. Also, this will be the last episode of Season 5, and there will be a couple of weeks before I start Season 6, which will be about mass murderers. I've gotten tons of great suggestions, and I've put together a season that I think everyone will thoroughly enjoy. And don't worry, there'll still be at least two episodes each week between seasons. I'll be posting episodes of some of the cases that don't fit into the current seasons that I've been wanting to cover. Thanks again to everyone who watches and or listens and supports the show, and don't forget to check out my other show, Somewhere Sinister, which you can find on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Take care. Joliet, Illinois is a city south of Chicago that sits on the Des Plaines River. The presence of both the Joliet Prison and the Statesville Prison earned the city the nickname Prison City. Joliet Prison was considered one of the toughest prisons in the U.S. until it closed down in 2002. The prison has been in countless movies and TV shows, being the main location in the show Prison Break and the prison that Jake is released from at the beginning of The Blues Brothers. Milton Johnson brutalized a teen couple and was sent to prison for it. When he was released early for good behavior, he took his rage out on anybody he could, causing a summer of terror around the Joliet area. This is Monsters. On July 15, 1983, Will County Auxiliary Deputies Dennis Foley and Stephen Mayer began their patrol. Both men were members of the county's volunteer safety patrol and spent their weekend evenings patrolling the neighborhoods and businesses. They didn't normally chase down hardened criminals, just kept an eye out for vandals and prowlers. Dennis had served in the United States military before becoming a division manager at Consolidated Freightways in Chicago. The 50-year-old widower had five grown children and was committed to keeping his community safe. 22-year-old Stephen had recently returned from his honeymoon and not only volunteered for the sheriff's department, he also worked as a part-time dispatcher for the Willow Springs Police Department. About 3.30 a.m. on the morning of July 16th, deputies saw a truck stopped partially blocking the road and pulled over to offer assistance. As they pulled up, they saw that the back end of the truck was protruding into the road while the front was up against a red Chevy Chevette. As the deputies got out of their car, a man stepped out from behind the truck and opened fire. Deputy Mayor was shot multiple times in the chest and he staggered to the side of the road where he collapsed into a ditch and died. Deputy Foley was shot in the face and the abdomen and he pretended to be dead hoping the attacker would stop shooting. At the same time, a Chevy Suburban passed by on the road and the attacker opened fire on them as well. Both passengers were struck and the vehicle veered off the road, coming to a stop in a soybean field. As soon as the man fled the scene in his truck, Deputy Foley reached into the passenger side of the patrol car and radioed for help. At the same time, the passenger in the Suburban, 21-year-old Laura Troutman, climbed out of the vehicle and despite having been shot six times, she ran across the field to a nearby farmhouse to get help. The resident called the police and Laura went back to the Suburban to check on the driver who was 24-year-old George Keel, her boyfriend. The couple had been returning home after a night of hanging out with friends. When other deputies arrived on the scene, they first found Deputy Foley clinging to life and began administering first aid. Other deputies found Deputy Mayor's body in the ditch and determined that he was dead. Both deputies' wallets and service weapons were missing. Then they checked on the Chevette that had been parked in front of the truck. Inside was the body of Richard Paulin, who went by Dewey. He had been shot in the back and killed. Kathy Norwood was found lying on the ground just outside the passenger door of the car. She had also been shot in the back and killed. It turned out that the two had pulled over in that spot for some privacy and they were victims of a surprise attack. Deputies Foley and Mayer had stumbled onto the killer while he was in the act. When Deputy Pat Lombardo approached the Suburban, Laura was there and she begged the man not to shoot her. 
Deputy Lombardo assumed she was going into shock and didn't ask her why she thought he would shoot her, but Laura would tell investigators later that it was one of the deputies that shot them. Authorities didn't know what to make of that claim, but by the end of the investigation, they would come to believe that in a matter of seconds, the shooting started and the Suburban was approaching. So Deputy Mayer stepped out and put up his hand as an attempt to get them to stop, but he was shot in the process. Him stepping forward and raising his hand at the same time Laura heard gunshots most likely seemed like Mayer was shooting. Laura gave descriptions of two suspects to the police, but the first one was clearly Deputy Mayer. The second one, however, was of a heavy-set black man in his mid-thirties with short hair. Laura was taken to the hospital where she recovered from her wounds. Deputy Foley was also taken to the hospital where he was in critical condition. He would remain in the hospital on life support, fighting for his life for about a month before succumbing to his wounds. At the crime scene, there wasn't much evidence. Investigators found shoe prints from a size 11 Converse All-Star tennis shoe, and some witnesses nearby said they were walking on an adjacent street when they heard sirens and then saw a dark-colored truck speed past them at about 3.45 a.m. Also, underneath Deputy Mayor's body, investigators found a sales receipt from Walt's Tackle Shop. It was a handwritten receipt, and it had the name Sam Myers on it. Authorities weren't even able to finish investigating the early morning massacre before the killer struck again. The same day that investigators were processing the massive crime scene, Anthony Hackett and his girlfriend, Patricia Payne, both 18, left Emden, Illinois, headed north to spend the day at Six Flags Great America, just north of Chicago. The couple spent the entire day there, and at one point, Anthony bought a stuffed toy and put the receipt in his wallet. Then they left at 10 o'clock when the park closed. They made it just south of Joliet, where they pulled over and planned to get a little sleep before completing their journey in the morning. Anthony laid across the front seat and Patricia laid across the back seat of the Plymouth Fury and they both fell asleep. Patricia was awoken later by the sound of gunfire into the car. A man had shot Anthony multiple times, killing him. Then he commanded Patricia to get out of the car and get into his truck. He made her crouch down on the floor as he drove away. The man put a rag in the frightened woman's mouth and covered her eyes before driving around for hours. At one point, he pulled over in a secluded area and sexually assaulted his hostage. Then he started driving again, looking for a place to dump his victim. He eventually found a suitable spot on Highway 53 and pulled his truck over. He pulled Patricia out of the truck onto the median of the highway, where he stabbed her multiple times before hopping back in his truck and driving off. At 5 a.m., Ray Tusik was driving on Highway 53 on his way to go fishing when he spotted something in the median. He turned around and pulled over to investigate and he found a young woman, alive but clearly injured. He asked if she could stand up and she tried, but she wasn't able to. Another motorist, David Sims Jr., pulled over and the two men carried Patricia to Ray's car and put her in the back seat. Then they both headed to a local police station a few miles away. This was long before cell phones, so this was the fastest option to get the woman some help. Once there, an ambulance picked Patricia up and she was taken to the hospital, but she was in bad shape. Once at the hospital, Illinois State Police Special Agent John Maduga was able to get a minimal amount of information out of her before she was rushed into surgery. She was able to tell him that she and her boyfriend had pulled off the interstate to sleep and she believed that Anthony was shot. Patricia would end up surviving her attack after a long stay in the hospital. Agent Maduga left the hospital and immediately started driving down the interstate, searching for the gold Plymouth that Patricia had described. Amazingly, he spotted the car parked on the shoulder and pulled up behind it. Not knowing what to expect, he approached the vehicle with his gun drawn. In the front seat, he found Anthony Hackett lying face down. He had been shot multiple times and the passenger window was shattered. For the time being, these two incidents were investigated separately. On August 20th at about 11.15 a.m., Anna Ryan took her daughter-in-law, Pamela Ryan, and Pamela's friend Barbara Dunbar to her favorite pottery store in town. Greenware by Mary was owned by Marilyn Bears, and she was just days away from closing this shop and opening a new one in Lamont, just northeast of Joliet. When another customer, Edna Hawk, entered the store just after noon, she found the store empty and when she called out for Marilyn, she got no answer. Believing the store might have been broken into, Edna quickly flagged down a nearby sheriff's vehicle and expressed concern. 
Two deputies entered the store and didn't find anything in the front. When they went to the back and turned on the light, they found four women all stabbed in the chest multiple times. Three of the women had their hands tied behind their backs and one didn't. The three women would turn out to be Anna, Pamela, and Barbara. Marilyn's hands were untied, most likely because the attacker wanted her to get him money. An autopsy would find that the women had all been stabbed a combined 43 times and only Anna was shot. A bullet had gone through her neck and lodged in a wall in the ceramic shop. Investigators would find that the killer took Marilyn's purse and drove away in Anna's red and white Chevy Blazer, which was later found at a nearby car wash. Police initially looked at Marilyn's son, David Bears, as the prime suspect. He had a criminal record for burglary and admitted that he had been using drugs. When he was questioned, he told investigators that he had gotten up at 9 o'clock in the morning, had breakfast at the cafe, and then went into the new store where he worked with a co-worker all day. That alibi checked out, and based on the amount of money that could have been taken from the store, it seemed more like a crime of opportunity. Authorities were still trying to piece together the murder spree from the previous month. They weren't sure if the ceramic shop murders were the work of the same killer or not, but they weren't ruling anything out at this point. With nothing else to go on, investigators looked at the receipt that was found under Deputy Sayer's body. It could have easily just been a piece of garbage from the side of the road, but it was clean and the printing hadn't faded, so it seemed like it hadn't been there long. On September 12th, after some footwork, detectives showed up at the home of Sam and Dolly Myers in Joliet. When they pulled up, they immediately noticed a dark-colored 1977 Chevy truck parked out front. One of the detectives noted the license plate number was 889930B. While approaching the house, detectives ran into a man standing out front. They learned that he was Milton Johnson, and he was the stepson of Sam Myers and the son of Dolly. They asked if he ever drove the truck out front, and he said that he did, usually when it was available on weekends. They also jotted down his physical description, which matched the one they had gotten from Laura Troutman. Sam and Dolly were interviewed, but they'd been out of town during the time of the killings. They had taken a vacation to visit family in Mississippi, and Milton had taken care of their house while they were gone. It was confirmed that the couple had been in Mississippi, so Sam was cleared as a suspect, but now they had a new one, and his name was Milton Johnson. Milton Johnson was born on May 15, 1950, in Millry, Alabama, the middle child of three brothers. Milton's parents divorced when he was only four years old, and soon his mother, Dolly, married Sam Myers, who worked for a national construction company. This took the family all over the place, but they ended up settling in Joliet, Illinois. Milton struggled all through school and eventually dropped out in high school. He joined the Job Corps and learned how to weld, which led him to a job in Detroit, Michigan. That job didn't last, and he eventually found a job in a steel plant in Lamont. On February 15, 1970, a young couple drove into Pilcher Park in Joliet and found a quiet place to park. About a half an hour later, another vehicle approached and pulled up behind them. Milton got out of his car and tapped on the window, and when they rolled it down, he asked how long they were going to be there. As the girl started to answer, Milton shoved the barrel of a shotgun into the car and demanded she open the door. First, he stole their money, about $25, before telling the boy to lay down on the front seat facing the floor. Then he forced the young woman into the back seat and sexually assaulted her. If that wasn't enough, he used the car's cigarette lighter to burn her genitals. Then he smacked her so hard in the face that he broke her jaw. When he was finished, Milton ordered the young man to sit in the car with the door open because he wanted to shoot both of the teens and kill them with the same shot. The young man figured this was his only chance and took the opportunity to make a run for it. He ran to a nearby motel and used a phone booth to call the police. Milton panicked and jumped into the victim's car and drove away, with the woman still in the vehicle with him. He drove to a nearby hospital where he brought her inside. Milton was quickly tracked down and convicted of rape, burglary, and aggravated battery. He was sentenced to 25 to 35 years in prison. It turned out that Milton had regularly gone to the park, an area that people called Lover's Lane, and watched couples having intimate interactions. He finally escalated his peeping to an actual rape and was immediately caught. 
Despite a psychiatrist's findings, the prison system did not see him as a sexually dangerous inmate. I guess burning someone's genitals is just foreplay to those people. Milton became eligible for parole in 1980 and was denied the first four times, but was granted parole on his fifth try with the help of a prison counselor who believed that Milton was a changed man. He was released on March 9, 1983 and almost immediately went back to terrorizing people. On June 17, 1983, Teresa McKean left work at about midnight and began driving the five miles to her house. As she headed down Route 6, a truck began pulling up on her left-hand side, like it was going to pass her, but it didn't pass. He just kept pace with her, so she hit the brakes. At the same time, she heard a loud bang and her driver's side window shattered. As she realized what happened, the truck sped off. At this point, she just wanted to get home and she continued down the highway, but soon saw the truck again. The man had stopped in the road and was now standing outside, holding a gun, yelling at her, though she couldn't make out what he was saying. She took a chance and sped by him and he fired four shots at her car, missing all of them. Teresa floored it and when she got home, she immediately called the police. When a state trooper came out to interview her, she told him that she thought there was two men in the truck though she would later say that she only saw one man and wasn't sure why she said that at the time. She described the man with the gun as a heavy-set black man with short hair. When the trooper was retracing the route that Teresa said she took, he saw a truck pulled over on the side of the road with a man standing outside of it. The trooper asked him for his ID and noted that it was Milton Johnson, but he didn't see another person with him, so he continued with his investigation. On June 25th, the house of 68-year-old Honora Lahman and her sister, 68-year-old Zita Bloom, was reported as being on fire. When the fire department got the fire out, they found the charred bodies of Honora and Zita. They had been severely beaten before being shot. Then the bodies had been placed together in a sexual position and one of them had a turkey baster shoved in her vagina. The room they were in was set on fire and was clearly the point of origin for the blaze. The crime wouldn't be connected to Milton Johnson right away, but eventually he would be identified as the primary suspect. When Eric Johnson, no relation to Milton, came home from work on the evening of July 1st, his wife, Terry Lynn Johnson, wasn't home, but he was told that she had gone out with a friend and would be home later. Not thinking much of it, he went to bed, but when she still wasn't home the following morning, he began driving around town looking for her. He succeeded in finding her van, but she was nowhere to be found. By 5 p.m. that day, he filed a missing persons report with the police. Her disappearance was exceptionally odd since her son's first birthday was the very next day. At the same time, authorities were also informed that a local man named Kenny Chancellor had also gone missing. Anna Chancellor said her husband had left the house on the evening of July 1st and never came back. When she gave the deputy the vehicle information, it turned out that the vehicle had been towed. When they looked at the car, they found blood on the floor and a card written to Kenny from someone named Athena. The card also had blood droplets on it. Police knew that Terry Lynn Johnson sometimes went by the alias Athena McCall and they suspected the two were having an affair. Soon, Larry's body was found in a field in a rural area. The following day, Terry Lynn's body was found in a nearby drainage ditch. Both had been shot, but the medical examiner determined that it was by the same bullet. Terry Lynn was shot in the back and the bullet exited her breast. Then it entered Larry's chest, traveled through his heart, and lodged in his hip. Thirteen years later, Milton was finally able to shoot and kill a couple with the same bullet. Immediately after the investigators went to the Myers house and spoke with Milton, not only did the murder stop, but the truck disappeared from the front of the house. Sam had asked a friend if he could store the truck on his property, about a mile and a half away. Sam was trying to protect his stepson from becoming the prime suspect in the murders. He didn't think Milton was the killer, but since he had recently been released from prison, he assumed that authorities would start pointing fingers at him. He got rid of the truck in an effort to keep investigators from making the connection, but it was too late. They had already connected the dark-colored truck with Milton and the murders. Making the truck disappear only made them more suspicious. 
Investigators began getting tips from local women who had been run down or harassed by a man in a dark-colored Chevy truck. Some had gotten the license plate number, and it was 889930B. They started running their evidence against anything they had on Milton. Since he had been in prison, his fingerprints were on file, but they didn't get a match on anything from the July 16th massacre or the murder of Anthony Hackett. They did get a match to prints lifted from the ceramic store as well as the gear shifter of Anna Ryan's Chevy Blazer. Investigators then took a photo array to Patricia Payne's house and she picked out Milton's picture, but said she wasn't absolutely positive. She said she'd know for sure if she could hear his voice. A few days later, she was brought in by police to view a lineup and hear them all speak. She immediately picked Milton out of the lineup. That lineup happened on March 9, 1984. On March 8, Milton met with his parole officer for what he thought was a routine visit, but this time he ended up being questioned by two state police investigators. He continued to claim that he didn't know anything about any of the murders, and when the investigators told him his prints were found in the ceramic store, he claimed they must have been planted. The problem with that was that one of the fingerprints in the blazer was in blood. It's pretty hard to plant fingerprints in the victim's blood. At that point, the investigators placed Milton under arrest for first-degree murder. Investigators located Sam Meyer's truck, and he consented to a search. Inside, they found a long blonde hair matching Patricia Payne, a steak knife, and a receipt for a stuffed toy from the Six Flags Great America. The same receipt that Anthony had tucked into his wallet, which was then stolen by Milton after he gunned the man down in his sleep. After searching the truck, they got a warrant to search the Myers house where they found three 357 Magnum cartridges in a dresser in Milton's bedroom. Those rounds matched the round recovered from the ceramic store murder scene. They also recovered size 11 Converse All-Stars that matched the footprints at the store. The trial was scheduled for June 1st, 1984, but the day before, Milton's parents hired a lawyer to replace his public defender, something that was completely unnecessary due to the evidence. When the trial finally happened, Milton was only tried for the murder of Anthony Hackett and the kidnap, rape, and attempted murder of Patricia Payne. Patricia took to the stand, pointed to Milton, and explained how he murdered her boyfriend, took her captive, sexually assaulted her, then stabbed her and left her on the side of the road to die. Pretty straightforward. Oh, and the prosecutor also mentioned that the stuffed toy receipt was in the truck, Patricia's hair was in the truck, and red fibers from the inside of the truck were found just outside Anthony's car. The defense lawyer argued that the truck had a crack in the windshield, but Patricia never told the police that there was a crack in the windshield. Wow, Milton's parents really paid good money for that lawyer, huh? Milton Johnson was found guilty on all charges and was sentenced to death. Milton, however, was not done in court, though. He was also put on trial for the four counts of murder at the ceramic store on August 20th, 1983. This time, his parents settled on the public defender. Like many criminals who are facing an almost definite guilty verdict, Milton chose to go down in flames. First, he requested new lawyers due to disagreements over evidence presented. Then he changed his mind and agreed to keep one of the public defenders, but wanted the other one replaced, which the judge agreed to. Now the trial was back on, until Milton changed his mind again and fired his public defenders based on another disagreement. Now Milton declared that he would represent himself. Not something that's ever worked out well in a capital murder case. I think this happens because the defendant is clearly guilty, and the lawyer has no other choice but to just make sure the trial is fair and that they don't get over-sentenced. But that's not good enough for the defendant. The public defender can only do so much against strong evidence. So the defendant ultimately goes, screw this, I can do it myself. They think they can weasel themselves out of a murder conviction. Of course, the judge didn't want this to cause Milton to later win an appeal, so he made the public defenders remain during the trial as consultants to Milton. Though as far as I know, in order to represent yourself, you usually have to waive your rights to appeal due to ineffective counsel, which always seemed funny to me. You represent yourself, you lost, and then you appealed because you did a shit job at defending yourself. Milton presented no opening argument, he called a few witnesses who claimed to have seen Anna Ryan's blazer in a different part of town being driven by a white man when Milton should have been driving it from the ceramic store to the car wash, and then he presented no closing argument. 
The prosecutor explained that the two people who supposedly identified Anna's blazer by its license plate number couldn't have possibly seen it from where they claimed to have been. They were approximately 500 to 800 feet away from the vehicle at the time, which would have been like trying to read a magazine from at least 12 feet away. It was possible that they did see a red and white blazer being driven by a white man that day, since there was a local man who owned a vehicle similar to Anna's, but they couldn't positively claim it was Anna's. He also presented the fingerprint evidence, the shoe print evidence, and the ballistics evidence. Unsurprisingly, Milton Johnson was found guilty of the four murders and was given another death sentence. Milton was not charged with the July 16th shootings where he killed deputies Foley and Mayer, Richard Paulin, Kathy Norwood, George Keel, and attempted to murder Laura Troughton. The evidence against him wasn't as strong and the prosecutor believed that Laura's immediate identification of a white police officer having been the shooter would have complicated the trial. Milton is also believed to be responsible for the murders of Kenny Chancellor and Terry Lynn Johnson, as well as the murders of Honora Laman and Zeta Bloom. He's suspected in a number of other multiple homicide cases where numerous similarities were present. The prosecutor said it was a difficult decision to not try Milton for more murders, but he was satisfied with two death sentences. Milton filed multiple appeals, which all failed, but they did postpone his execution date long enough to have the governor of Illinois repeal the death penalty in the state. Both of his death sentences were commuted to life sentences without the possibility of parole, so he will remain in prison for the rest of his life. He is 71 years old. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again and be safe.